Okay. He was talking about tornadoes at the conference I put on over in Fayetteville every year. Two years ago, we had a tornado alert. We had to evacuate the whole auditorium right at the, we had to stop the speaker and evacuate everybody out of the whole hotel. So let's not hope it doesn't happen here. But you are in Tornado Alley, remember. <laughs> so anything can happen, but oh, we got a bubble over this place. Nothing's going to happen here today. <laughs> OK. Mm. Now, he's only given me, um, I think, an hour and a half. Uh, it's going to be really hard to get all the material that I want to talk about in. I'm going to do my best. But I've got so much, and it's so different than anything you've ever heard. So I'm going to really try to get as much in as I can. I don't know if there's going to be any time for questions. I'll do, if there is, we'll take them. Otherwise, I'll be here the rest of the, the conference. And tomorrow, they're going to have a, a forum where they're going to be letting people ask questions. But I have so much, I don't want to stop it and uh, go into that part. This is a little easier. I just came from China. And when you give a lecture over there, it takes a lot longer. You have the translation back and forth. And you're trying to remember where you were in the lecture so you can continue. This is a lot easier. As I travel all over the world and uh, speak every place on all of my material, uh, I'm just going to give a little brief part about my background where I started. I don't want to go too much into it because there's not going to be enough time. But when I began in the 1960s, then hypnosis was only used for habits. Stop smoking, lose weight. So that's where I began. And I got into reincarnation by accident. If anything is ever an accident, in those days, nobody was using hypnosis for past life regressions. It just wasn't done because nobody knew anything about it. They didn't know about past lives. They, well, nobody knew anything about metaphysics. There was no new age. And a lot of these younger kids have a hard time understanding that, that there was a time when none of this existed. And that's where I started out. They said I'm like a pioneer because when I began, there wasn't any of this. So that way, I didn't have anyone to tell me what you could or couldn't do with hypnosis. I developed my own technique. And that's why my technique in hypnosis is not like any other one out there, because I had to do it and put it together over the last 40 years. Why do I have to do this? Why can't I do something different? Nobody told me, you have to do it this way. So I ended up creating my own technique where we are able to get all the knowledge we want. And I don't know, some of you, not into metaphysics, you may not understand this, but I found a way to, to contact the source of all knowledge. It is a huge source. It's the highest source in the universe. And I contact it through my clients. You can have the answer to anything you want to know. It has all knowledge. Also, it's able to do instantaneous healings. That's why my technique developed into the healing. And this is what I'm teaching all over the world now. We can have instant healing of any disease, anything, in just one session. And I had to develop it as I went. And that's what I'm teaching now in my classes everywhere. And everyone all over the world, they're getting it. They're understanding it, even in China. I go to Russia a lot. The doctors there are incorporating this into their own practices. So the UFO part was a small part of my work. I think I'm going to take this off. It's kind of hot. Are you hot out there? Maybe it's the lights. OK. <laughs> huh? No, I can get it off, but I was just thinking. Maybe it's the lights, it's kind of hot. Okay. I'm gonna sit up here a while, you don't wanna sit here and sweat anyway. Okay. But 
That's why they say I'm a pioneer in this because nobody was even doing past life regression. And I know no one is doing the technique that I use with the healings. But over the years that I've been doing this, I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of clients. They come from all over the world. So all the information I get is based on what I find from my clients. I've been doing the UFO work for 25 years. I've written four books on it. And the reason I can get such good information is I don't work in the light levels. Most of the other hypnotists work in the lightest level of trance. There, the conscious mind is extremely active. The conscious mind is out there with all this, oh, you're making it up. It's my imagination. I read it in a book. I saw it in a movie. The conscious mind is sitting there, jabber, jabber, jabber. So especially when you get into the UFO information, it's going to be doing the same thing. So that's not the part I work with. I work in the deepest possible level of trance. It is called the synambulistic level. At that level, the person doesn't remember anything. We can get past the conscious mind and go direct to the real thing that happened. Now, I'm going to say they a lot, but this is what I call this force that I work with. They said in a UFO experience, it would be the most perfect, um, what do you want to call it, the most ideal situation would be that the person not remember anything at all about their experience because they've been coming since the beginning of time to this earth. They don't want to interfere with the person's life. So the most ideal situation would be that the person not remember anything at all about what they think happened. But with the pollution in the air, the additives to our food, the, if the person is on any kind of drugs, recreational drugs or med medical drugs, or if they're on alcohol, this affects the chemistry of the brain. So if they had a suspected uh, event or something, they are seeing it through their, this chemistry of the brain in a distorted fashion. This means they're seeing it the way they think it happened with all the emotion and the fear added in. But it's not really what happened at all. That's the difference. Because if you don't understand something, you're going to bring in fear. Fear is the strongest emotion that a human has. You don't understand something, you make it into something horrible that happened. That's where the other investigators are getting this negativity. They are keeping them in the light levels. Well, in the way I work, I take them past the emotion, past the fear, it's gone. And we go to what really happened. And afterwards, they'll say, well, if that's what happened, I can live with it. But when you have hundreds and hundreds of people giving you the same information, you know it has to be real. They can't make it up because they don't know what I'm looking for. They don't know what I have found. And it's the same story again and again. I've done cases that the other investigators have done where the person will tell me they had this horrible experience and they're afraid to even go out the front door. The aliens are after them and all of that. I do a session with the same client. We get a totally different story. Then they say, okay, I can live with that. See the difference? You push out the conscious mind. The part that I call the, uh, <coughs> the stupidest part of the human being <coughs> is the conscious mind. It thinks it knows everything, wants to be in control, but it doesn't know anything at all. You get past that, you'll find out the real things that happen. So that's where all of my information has come from, by working in the deepest possible level of trance. And that's where we can have the healings too. But the UFO phenomena now in my work is even going further and further than anybody could ever imagine. That's why I'm writing more and more books, because they keep giving me more and more information. But as John Max told me one time, he said, no one will ever be able to understand the UFO phenomena until you understand metaphysics. People try to keep the two separate. 
They are not. It's all interwoven. It's all the same. So I guess I want to go back. If I tell this story, I'm trying to figure out where to start because there's so much material to get in. Okay. And especially with the three waves, because this is what I'm lecturing on all over the world. And people were identifying with this. Even in China, they said, thank goodness, finally, somebody is explaining what's happening. And it makes so much sense. So the three waves is the most important part we've got right now. And I think you're going to be able to identify with that. But before we get to that part, I'm going to have to go back and set the stage a little. In order to do that, I have to go back to the very beginning, <laughs> all the way back to the beginning, where we all came from in the beginning. Because you have to understand that if you're going to understand the role that the ETs play in the whole picture. They're not over here some strange, weird uh, people that are out to hurt you. They get blamed for an awful lot of things they don't have anything to do with. They're not that at all. They're all part. We're all interwoven. We're all connected. So in order to understand that, we're going to have to go back to the very beginning. I have clients that come, and on their list of questions, they always say, I want to know, where did I come from? I said, well, that's easy to answer. We all came from the same place. And they said, no, I mean, what, my home planet? I said, you don't have a home planet. You have a planet you have lived on in other lifetimes, but that's not your home planet. That's just one of your schools that you attended in this long journey that you're on. But that's not your home. We all began with God. They call him the source. That's where we all started out in the very, very beginning, way, way back. And when we were all with God, or the source, it was wonderful. We were all together, and it was total love. I've had people go back to these times. That's where I get my information. They go back to when they were recreated and they were living with God. Everything that I talk about, everything I write about, comes from the people I work with. My job is to put it together like a reporter and put it together like a puzzle. But we were all together and we were happy. It was wonderful. Nobody wanted to leave. When they're there, they just want to stay there. That's where we all began. But God is the one that got curious. He wanted to know more. And this is when it all began. He burst out in all directions. Now, some people call this the Big Bang Theory. When all the particles flew out in all different directions, some of those particles became galaxies, some of them became universes, some of them became planets, and the majority of them became your own individual soul. That's where you all began. When I take people back to what they really, really are, they always see themselves as a tiny little spark of light. That's what you really are, this tiny little spark of light that flew out whenever God it burst out. And when he did this, he said, Go, my children, and learn. Learn everything. Learn everything that's possible to learn. Have every experience there is to, learn, to be. That's what life is all about, the experiences, lessons. And what did you learn from the experience? We get lost up in the negativity in the experience, not really realizing, what am I supposed to be learning from this whole thing? So he said, go and have all these experiences, learn everything, then come back and share with me. So we started on our journey. And we, have, we can't not finish until we graduate and finish everything, then we can return to God, dump all of our information into the gigantic computer, <laughs> where he sorts through it all over again. But when you start out, you don't just begin on Earth. This is the most difficult planet in the universe to live on. It's the most challenging planet to live on. When you come here, you're getting close to graduation because this is so difficult to live here. 
You've already been through the easier planets, the easier lifetimes. Now you're really in for a hard one. They say when you volunteer to come to Earth, they're very proud of you because they know you're very, very brave. Because this is not easy. It's the densest, heaviest, lowest planet in the universe. And when they come into the body, they feel that pull. They said, oh, I don't like it here. It's dense, it's heavy, because this is the hardest one to live on. Out there, especially on the spirit side, it's all light and beautiful. But you all chose to be here. Nobody has ever made you do anything against their will. So, before you come here, you have already had many other lifetimes on other planets, other dimensions. <coughs> Some, I've had people go back to these lifetimes, even where they would go back to where there were light beings in many other dimensions. Universes where the law of physics is not at all the way it is here. We have to thinking this is all there is. There is so much more. But you've all been through those things. But part of the school system is you're not supposed to remember. And I asked them one time, wouldn't it be easier if we remembered why we were here, if we remembered our connection with our other friends and our family, our contracts that we make? Wouldn't that be easier? And he said, no, it wouldn't be a test if you knew the answer. So the memory has to be taken away when you come here. We're the only planet in the universe where the memory is taken away before we come in. The ETs, all the rest of them, they remember their connection to source. They feel very sorry for us because we have to fight our way back to get the memories back because that's what it's all about right now is getting back to that stage and remembering where we came from. But uh, I got so much information flooding into my brain. So it's got, my brain has got to catch up with it now. <laughs> okay. But... When you come to the Earth School, it's such a difficult school, and it's a long school. It's, you can't get out of it. Once you sign on for the Earth School, you have to stay until you have completed all of the grades and all of the assignments. If you don't learn the lesson, you take it over again. This is where karma comes in. You take the lesson over again the next time because you can't get to the next grade until you complete this grade. You can't go from kindergarten to college. It's impossible. It's a gradual process. And so we're in the middle of all of this. But it's a long school. So when you sign on, they say, well, remember what you're getting into here. This is not going to be easy, but you will really learn a lot. So when you come to the Earth School, you don't just immediately become a human. That's where you're at now, but you have to be everything before you become a human. And this, they told me this is one of the most important things I could teach people. Everything has consciousness. Everything is alive. And this will get around to the ETs, believe me, but I want to set the stage first. Everything is alive. Everything has consciousness. So your soul, your spirit, is what goes from different bodies, things, because you are not a body, you have a body. This is the suit of clothes, the costume you're wearing right now for this job right now, this lesson. But that's not the real you. The real you is the one that's been around forever and will continue to be around forever. So when you come to the Earth School, First, you have to be air. And all of this is in my books. I have whole sections on how you can be these different things. Once you start understanding this, you realize everything is alive. We will treat nature a whole lot better when we realize we're all one, we're all part of everything. But first, you have to be part of the air. Then you have to be rocks, dirt. We don't think of those things as being alive. And when I've had many, many people be rocks, and they say, when you're a rock, life is very slow. (laughs) (laughs) 
And I always asked during the session, <coughs> what was the purpose of that life? And he said, well, she thinks she doesn't have much freedom now. <laughs> Remember what it was like when you were a rock. <laughs> so what I mean, everything you have been, what did you learn from it? Then you have to be plants. You have to know what it's like to be a flower, what it's like to be an ear of corn. And I think it's in one of my convoluted universe books. I've got a whole section on these in life. People have gone back to those kind of lifetimes. And then you have to know what it's like to be animals. What would it be like to be a wolf and run? What would it be like to be a bird and fly? Everything has a lesson. But if you realize this, we would be kinder to our environment. Then, in among all of that, and I don't know how much over your head I'm getting to a lot of you, Maybe you haven't even thought of these things. I'm trying to keep it simple. <laughs> in between the plants and the animals, you have what are called the little people, the fairies, the gnomes, the leprechauns. And when I go to Ireland, they identify with this a lot. The, the dryads, they are the nature spirits that take care of nature. You've all been those also. You have to before you get to be the human body. So you have to go through all of these experiences before you're ready to become a human because that's much more complicated. Then you get to be a human, you have to be everything. You have to live on every country in the world, every continent, every country. You have to be every religion in the world. You have to be every race in the world. If more people understood this, there wouldn't be the prejudice. Because I've had people who are very prejudiced against certain race or religion. Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> Next time around, they have to be the very thing they are prejudiced against. That's how this earth school works. You're always karma. That, until you learn that lesson, you can't go on to the next lesson. You have to be male and female many, many times. And usually when I say that, a man in the audience will shout out at me, what do you mean I've always been a man? What would you learn if you had been one sex through eternity? You wouldn't learn very much, would you? Everything has to have balance. Everything has to be in order and balance. You have to know what it's like to be on every side of every situation it's possible before you graduate. So by the time you get to this stage, hopefully you've gone through a lot of that. Because most of us have been caught on this karmic wheel going round and around and around, repeating the same lessons again and again and again. So the idea is to get out of that if we're going to go into the new earth. And that's what I'll be going to before we finish this lecture. But you have to get off of the wheel of karma and learn. So anyway, that's where we all came from. That's the short version and where we are right now. We're still in this school, but the majority of us are trapped on that wheel of karma because it's so difficult. That's why we make the same mistakes. I'll take people back through lifetimes and found out through maybe three or four lifetimes, same pattern, same mistakes. Because if you don't work it out in this lifetime, you have to come back the next lifetime, same people, same circumstances, only next time it's even gonna be more difficult. You don't get out of it. And when I tell my clients that, they'll say, oh no, I don't want anything to do with that person anymore. And I said, you better work it out now then, or you're gonna to have to repeat it. That's the law of the universe, that's the law of karma. Okay, so I think I've kind of got that part so you can understand because this is all going to flow together. And in between all of these countless lifetimes that you go through for thousands and thousands of years, you go to the spirit side in between. And I've written books about that to know where you go, what it's like to die, where you go on the other side and you make your plans to come back the next time, and you meet with other souls that you have been with in the life you just left. You look at your life, and you have advisors, you have counsels, 
And they look at your life and say, well, you did okay here, but you need more practice in this part, and you need to come back again and make corrections here. It's like advisors in a school and principals in a school. So you meet with the souls that you have just left in that life. And you'll say, we didn't do some, such a good job, did we? Let's go back and do it again. This time you be the husband, I'll be the wife. Or you be the mother, I'll be the child. <laughs> you can reverse roles around any way you want. And I have this happening countless times in my work. You can reverse the roles around any way you want because this is just a play. Life is an illusion, life is a game. It's just a play. So you're all actors, producers, directors in your own play. The only thing is the script isn't being written as you go along. So that way you can change the script anytime you want. You can have anything you want in your life that way if you understand. This is an illusion, it's just a play that you're involved in. Okay, so now I'm gonna bring in the ETs and their role in this. They're not over here something strange, they're just a soul having an experience in a different type of body, which you have all done yourself. The physical body, I said I call it a suit of clothes, a costume that you're wearing right now to play this part in this play. It can look like anything, and I've had some pretty strange looking ones too, but that's just the costume they are wearing in that part they're playing right now. That's all it is. They're having the same adventures you're having. They're all trying to get to where they can graduate and go on too. It's just different roles and they're different planets and different universes. So they're all very much involved with us. So I want you to get over this idea that they're, they're different and they're evil and all of that because it doesn't, it's not what it's all about. Okay, so in order to understand the role of ETs with Earth, we have to go back to the beginning. <laughs> it's a different beginning. This is the beginning of life on Earth and their part in that. And I first began to discover this in the 1980s in some of my earlier books. Now I'm finding it all the time. But there are councils over everything. There are councils over the Earth planets. There are councils over the solar system. There's councils over the galaxy, councils over the universes. There are rules and regulations that are very definite that are set up. And all beings, no matter where they are, must obey the regulations and laws of these councils. That's is very definite. That's why when people are talking, they're out here hurting us and everything, I know better, because there's rules and regulations against all of that. <coughs> so they must all, all the beings in the universes must abide by these councils' rules. So when life began on Earth, there are beings that are called the Archaic Ones. They have been around forever. Their job is to go from planet to planet, creating life on those planets. This is their job. And people always ask me, well, how does God fit in with all of this? Oh, God is very active in this. The ETs are closer to God than we will ever be because they understand him, they work with him. Also, they need him to stay alive because they don't consume food the way we do. They live off of light. Many of them, there's many different kinds. They live off of light. So the light is absorbed through their body, through their skin. And I asked them one time, where does the light the, come from? From the source. So they are closer to him than we will ever be. But in the very beginning, these archaic ones, their job was to go from planet to planet, looking for planets that were capable of supporting life. And their job was to introduce life on those planets. And so they said, like with Earth, for instance, we all have records in these councils, in the history books in the council, where they keep track of the history of the planet. 
So when the planet gets to the point that it can support life, that is a very important time in the history of that planet. And when that happens, especially in the case of Earth, Earth was giving its life charter. That meant now life can begin. Now, what kind of life? They go through planets all over the universe is looking for something that is ready. And that was when Earth got to that point, they're told to go and introduce cells. And I asked them one time, where do these cells come from that you develop life from? They said, it doesn't matter. We collect them throughout the universes. And we introduce what we think will grow in that place. It all depends on the primeval soup and the, the conditions of the planet, what will grow. They said, you would have been surprised what you could have looked like. <laughs> all depends on the conditions in the planet and what will grow and what, not, what will not. They introduce single-celled organisms. All they want them to do is begin to clump together to form a multi-celled organism. They don't care what it's going to be as long as life begins. Then it can be manipulated later, but first they have to get life started. And I've had people who've gone back to lifetimes when they were the cedars. And the, they would land in the spaceships and they would introduce these cells. A whole lot has to be done before this, but this would be a much longer lecture <laughs> because they were involved in producing the, the water and producing the plants, all of this, before life could ever begin. There was a whole lot of things that had to be done, cleaning out the atmosphere. But that would take too long to go into all of that. But they wanted to, con to go into something that's multi-celled so we can start producing some kind of a life form. And they said, you'd be surprised at how fragile life really is. Many times they would go back and I've had people go to lifetimes when they were the recorders. They would go back and check on the planet and see what was growing and what is not. So they go back and check on these things. But they said, the many times they would go back to a planet where they had started life and it had all fallen apart. It had begun to make multicelled organisms and it all fell apart and the planet was lifeless again. Then they had to go back to the council. What do we do now? Do we start over again? Or do we just let it be a dead planet? So this is their decisions. You can imagine the eons of time this would take. And their job is to go from place to place and keep track of what is going on in that planet. So we're on the list anyway. So once life began, it began to clump together and make organisms. Then they let it grow and let it grow and they introduce animals. Some of the animals are from other planets and they bring them in to see what will, will be able to live here. So there's a whole lot of this, it's very complicated. And in my books you'll see a lot about this step by step as it all happened. Well then it finally gets to the point all right, the planet has developed to the point, now we have to have an intelligent animal. Something that will be able to make tools and build cities. Now, what do we do with that? They were trying to pick an animal that they thought would be the best one to manipulate genetically to become an intelligent being. They chose the ape, mostly because of the large brain capacity and because it had hands. Have to have hands if you're gonna to make tools. They said, actually the dolphin is much smarter. The dolphin is actually the smartest creature on the earth. But how are you going to teach a dolphin, even if you genetically manipulate it, how are you going to teach it to use hands? So they chose the ape. The ape is 98% compati genetically compatible with human beings. You can give an ape blood and it will live. So we are that closely tied with the apes. So then they began to genetically manipulate the ape to create a being. And they said, 
let's give this beautiful planet a being with intelligence and free will and see what he does with it. We're the only planet in the universe that has free will. There's a lot of things about Earth that we're the only one. So we are a very unique planet. We're the only one that has free will. I've had many people go back to lifetimes when they were on planets where they didn't have free will. And they were more than happy to get out of that lifetime. But here we have free will. So they said, let's give it free will and just see what happens. So as we began to, to uh, develop and to grow, we now have a creature that is capable of intelligence. They let it develop. Then they were going to have to come and show it how to do things. The only way they could do this, to teach it the next things it needed, how to grow, how to hunt, how to build, they had to come and live among these creatures and teach them what to do as they developed. Every culture in the world has a legend of the culture bringer. Every culture has that legend. The Indians have their corn woman, the one who he taught them how to plant, taught them about corn. Other ones teach them about fire. Every culture in the world has the legend of the culture bringer. And every one of these legends the culture bringer comes from the sky or from across the sea. It all fits in. So because the ETs can live as long as they want, they have complete control over their body. They don't die until they are ready to die. They lived with these cultures for many, many generations. So this is where you have your legends of the gods and the goddesses because they came from these beings and living among them and teaching them. Then they interbred, and these are the ones who were the leaders of those communities after the originals finally had to leave. So it all makes perfect sense when you begin to put it all together. Now, after we got more and more people, uh, they can no longer live with us anymore, live among us. Well, some are, but they don't, <laughs> they're not supposed to live like they did then. So now when it comes time for a new idea, a new invention, or something to be introduced to the people, it is put into the atmosphere, the idea is there, of the next step, the ev next evolution, the next part in this, the growth of our world. It's put into the atmosphere. Whoever picks up the idea is the one who will invent it. They don't care who invents it as long as it's invented in the timeline. And you all hear about people all over the world who are working on the same invention at the same time. Then eventually somebody comes up with the idea. This is why. I've worked with people all over the world who are involved with free energy. And they're all the same thing. That's why I know this will eventually happen. And I asked them one time, should I put these people together? The ones who are all working on these same inventions. They said, no, leave them alone. They each have their important part to play. If you join them together, it would uh, lessen their effect. It would reduce their abilities. So leave them alone and let them all make their own developments. And whoever gets it is the one who will invent the next invention. That's what's happening now. It's been happening for many, many years. Is when the next one is ready, it's, it's here. If you can understand this, if I find the latest groundwork, you can see the groundwork, what the ETs are doing, and how it is misjudged by so many people because they don't understand their real role in all of this and what's really happening. Okay, so along with the free will, there's another one that is the main directive. And this is the Star Trek directive of non-interference. So Star Trek, you know, is not fiction. But it is a directive of non-interference. This means once a civilization has been established and is developing, you cannot interfere with the development of that civilization. 
You have to allow them to make mistakes. You've got to step back, and because of the free will, they can't interfere with it. And I asked them one time, well, you're giving them these, uh, these teaching them how to grow plants, you're teaching them about fire, you're teaching them how to hunt, isn't that interference? They said, no, that's a gift that we give them one time when they reach that stage of development. We give them to them one time, then what they do with it is free will. Many times they will give us something, teach us something, we turn it into a weapon, or you start using it for a negative purpose. All they can do is shake their heads, you know. And I said, well, can't you come back and tell them that's not the way we told you, that's not what you're supposed to be using it for? They said, that's interference. They give it to us one time as a gift. What you do with it is your free will. This is very important because we're the only planet. This is why this is a grand experiment. See if we're going to be able to pull it off. And... We've had some pretty bad times, rocky times, that they really were not happy about. Now, the only exception to this rule, <coughs> the only time they would be allowed to interfere is if we were got to the point that we were going to blow up the world. If we were developed enough that we were going to destroy the world, then they would have to step in and stop us. Because if we were to blow up this planet, it would have reverberations throughout the solar system, even throughout the universe, as in the galaxies. And I said one time, well, you wouldn't think a little bitty planet like this would have that much influence. And we are a little tiny planet. We're isolated over here and quarantined over here in this part of the solar system on purpose. They don't want us influencing the rest of the solar system and the rest of the galaxy. We're quarantined over here. Actually, they're afraid of us, our violence. And they don't want that to spread. Because they said, we're the only ones that hurt people. In one of my sessions, they said, why do they say we're here to take over the world? It's ours, it always has been. <laughs> and we can't hurt you as much as you hurt each other. All they can do is watch and shake their heads. So anyway, they, uh, that's the only time they could interfere is if we get to that point. Now, there have been many, many civilizations down through time who have gotten to that point. I've had many people go back to these civilizations. I've heard them talk about the demise and what happened to these civilizations. Atlantis was only one of these civilizations. There were many, many other ones where they reached the peak of development. They knew how to use their minds in extraordinary ways. They had all the psychic abilities. They could heal themselves. They didn't die until they were ready to die. There was no disease. Even in Atlantis, they would got to the point where they could levitate rocks, they could mold rocks to be anything they wanted. This is how some of the monuments of the world were created by the survivors of Atlantis that carried that knowledge forward into Egypt and those places. But these other civilizations reached that point where they could do anything, the peak of development. They had high hopes for them, but guess what happened? And it's always the men, guys, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> the men are the ones who always, they want power, they want greed, and they want to know, what else can we do? You've got a perfect world, you have everything you want, and all of a sudden they start saying, well, what if we do this, what if we do that? And it ends up causing a lot of trouble because they want to take control. And this happened in every single one of these civilizations especially in Atlantis. There was crystals. But in the new book, Three Waves, I have what really happened in Atlantis. And I just got that session uh, right before that book was going to print. And I thought I always knew what happened to Atlantis because it was the misuse of the crystals. And this was a totally different story. 
And I said, I've never heard that before. They said, that's because we've never told it to anybody before. So it gets to the point when they cannot allow it to go any further, they will have to destroy the civilization to keep it from spreading and to keep it from doing damage that will spread throughout the universe. They don't like to do that because each time it happened, the civilization had to begin again from nothing. Can you imagine a civilization that had everything, they could do everything, all of a sudden happened to going back to being primitive? Where they don't have any tools, they don't have anything, all of a sudden they start all over again from the primitive stage. They said it takes too long. They don't like to do that. But they've always left enough survivors so they can rebuild the civilization again. But they only do it in extreme cases when there's no other way. You're probably wondering what I found out about Atlantis. I guess I better tell you the abbreviated form anyway. Because <laughs> I always thought it was crystals. Well, what it was, they said now, was these scientists were experimenting. Whereas they were already doing the inbreeding with the half animal, half humans. All of your legends of the half animal, half humans, centaurs, uh, all of those that we found through history were not Greek and Roman legends. They started with Atlantis and their experimentation. That's where it all came from. That was one of the reasons they had to go down because they were disobeying the laws of nature. There was a lot of things they were doing that was wrong. But the one that really took the cake, besides the crystals, the science be scientists began fooling around with what they called dark matter. And I wanted to know what dark matter was. And I think it's the same thing that we refer to now as antimatter. And how many of you know about the collider experiments? It, it's in, uh, in Switzerland. This is the same thing. Every time I have these sessions, they say you must know these things because you're going down the same path. But they were fooling around with dark matter, and in the days of Atlantis, they wanted to create their own universe. They wanted to create wormholes. The same thing the scientists are saying now with the Collider experiment. And they were fooling with the dark matter, and they ended up being successful but it began to destroy the grids of the earth. The energy was so powerful, it created the grids of the earth began collapsing. They knew they had to stop it or it would have been an escalating event. The entire world would have imploded, then it would have spread out to the, the solar system and it would have spread through the whole universe. In cases like that, they have to stop it because you can't have a whole planet be destroyed even if we are a little tiny planet, the, the, vibe, the vibes would reverberate throughout the universe and it would interfere with many, many uh, other civilizations on other planets and even in other dimensions. They said it would like, be like undeclared war in other dimensions. And I don't have time to go into dimensions, but we have all these other dimensions around us. They're invisible. You can't see them because they're vibrating at a different frequency. That it's like when you watch a propeller blade or a fan blade, as it speeds up, it becomes invisible, but it's there. So these are at a different vibration and frequency, and there are beings living on these other dimensions. So they said if we were to do something to this planet, it'd be like undeclared war on all the other dimensions around us. So there's a much bigger things here going on than you even imagine. So that's the only time they can interfere is if we get to that point again. Because they said, finally, we have reached the point where Atlantis was. We're getting back technology. And we can have so much more. And your psychic abilities are coming back. We are getting to the point where we were at the tight again if we don't mess it up. That's what they're worried about. Now, some people call these DTs the watchers because that's their job. They watch us and see what we're doing and take care of us. In my one book, I call it the custodians because they've been taking care of us since the beginning of time. The other book is Keepers of the Garden. We are the garden. But all this time, 
They have been watching us, taking care of us, making sure we don't <laughs> blow ourselves up, sitting there shaking their heads because they can't come in and stop us from doing these things. Everything was fine, I guess, even though we went through the Second World War, we've had all these horrible things that we do to each other. But what really happened was right after the Second World War, when we dropped the atomic bomb, that really got their attention. Because that was when we had discovered atomic energy. And if you remember the history of ufology, that is when the UFO flap began at the end of World War II. When they began reporting UFOs for the first time was at that time. Because they said, the, we shot off the atomic bombs in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They said, we better get down there and see what these kids are playing with. <laughs> and they saw what we were doing. They said, no, this will never work. They are fooling around with something they don't know how to handle. We were not supposed to have atomic power at that time. When atomic power was supposed to have been developed, it was supposed to be for positive, for good. And I said, well, we do use it for good. We use it for power. They said, no, it will never be the same because when it was created, it was created as a weapon. So it will always have that aura of negativity surrounding it. So it will never be what it was really supposed to be. But they said, these kids can't handle this. They don't know it's too great of a power. They can't even handle their own lives. Here we were stuck on the wheel of karma. And we just came through this uh, World War II. We can't handle the world. We can't handle our own lives. How are you going to handle a power as, as strong as the atomic power? So they knew we would never be able to do it. We're too stuck on Earth. We've been here too long. He was stuck in the negativity. So they had to go back to the council. What do we do now? They can't be allowed to continue with this because the power is too great, they could destroy the world. What are we going to do? Well, you, you can't just go in and say, stop it. That's interference. So what are we going to do? They came up with a plan that I think is brilliant. And I found this out through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. It took me years to put the whole thing together. Because you gotta remember, these people that are sitting among you now have no conscious memory of any of these contracts that they made. None of you do. Some of you do have memories. I've had them come to me that remember being born, they remember what they came in to do, but those are rare. The majority of you remember, forget when you're born on Earth and you gotta struggle your way back. But they went back to the council and this is the plan they came up with. We can't interfere from the outside. Maybe we can influence from the inside. The ones on earth are too stuck in their wheel of karma. What if we ask for volunteers? People who have never been on earth before. People who are not caught up in the ways of the world. Pure souls who have never been through all of this on this hard, difficult planet. What if we ask for volunteers of people to come and help? So the call went out throughout the universe. Who wants to come and help planet earth? Planet Earth is in trouble. Who wants to help? And I've had many, many people go back to when these things were happening. And some of them were on the spirit side. They're making their plans to come back into a life. And they say, who wants to go and help Earth? And one of my clients said, I stupidly raised my hand. Because <laughs> they get here and they said, oh my gosh, what was I thinking of? This place is horrible. It's dense. It's heavy. Uh, this is a really hard place to live in. But they asked for the volunteers. Now the volunteers came from two places is what I'm finding. Some have never been on earth before. 
They've always been with God, with the source. They've never been any kind of a body at all. Can you imagine with somebody like that who has never ever experienced any kind of a life at all, what it'd be like to come into this mess we have on earth? Can you imagine how hard that would be on some of these souls? But they do it out of love because they want to help. But can you imagine how difficult that would be? Because they go back and they realize the minute when they were allowed to leave the source, I want to go and help. I, I want to help this planet. Then they get here and, oh my gosh, they don't understand anything that's going on here. The other group that I found were ETs who lived, they were living their own life. They were on spaceships. They were living on other planets. They were perfectly happy in their own life. And the call went out and they said, all right, I'll go and help. But then when I get done, I'm coming back to my life here. But they agreed to come and help. So many, many, many of them in here in this room are ETs who decided to come into a human body at this most important time in our history. And, but they don't remember this consciously. I can get into some really heavy metaphysics here, but I don't want to, uh, I don't know where this audience is. I don't know how much you, you know or how much you can take. That's the thing. Trying to keep it simple. <laughs> it's not your normal UFO talk anyway, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, since the information I'm getting now is more and more complicated, I'm getting more and more really hard metaphysical information and concepts and theories that nobody has heard of before. They keep giving me more and more. Okay, you are not just this body in this room. You are part of a greater soul that is called facets, chards, however you want to look at it, which means if you want to think like the facets of a diamond, this life is one of these facets. And you, you follow me? Yeah. Are charred. They have different ways of describing it. But also, these other parts are also you. And you're all living these other lives, past, present, and probable futures all at the same time. You can't know about it because it'd be too confusing. You have to focus on this life right now. So you can't focus on these other parts of you. Well, some of these people who are the ETs on the other ships leave their ET body there in a form of suspended animation. Sometimes they're in the chamber, and I've had them see, go back and check on it every once in a while to see if it's okay. The body is in suspended animation, so when they come here to live a life here, they're, they don't want to stay here. They'll go back to live their life and re get back into the body on the, other, on the spaceship. See, it's a little way out, but can you follow me? Okay, because they don't want to be here. Now, these three waves, when they come in, uh, the first and second waves especially, are surrounded with like a sheath or a covering to keep them from accumulating karma. Because they don't want to be here. They don't want to stay here. Do their job and get out. But karma will hold them. It will trap them into the wheel and they'll be forced to keep returning. So these people, like these other ETs, they come and do their job, don't accumulate karma, and then they can leave and go back. Okay, now, I'm gonna go into the three waves in a minute, but consider this ET energy is so different than the normal human energy, where we have had many, many lifetimes. It's a different energy altogether. So when that type of a soul comes into a human body, into the fetus, it is very difficult to adapt because the energy is too strange. You understand what I mean? It's too different. Many times the mother will have up to three miscarriages because the energy can't, is too strong for the mother's body. In that case, the ETs have to help adapt the mother's energy of the body so it can carry a fetus of this type. And that takes a lot of work. And sometimes when the ET energy comes into the fetus, only a portion will come in at the beginning when it's born because it's too strong. And it may be 
three or four years before another part of the energy is brought in. I've had some of my cases where there are eight, nine, ten is a crucial year, it seems to be. They'll remember something happening to them when they're about ten years old. This is about the time the full energy is allowed to come into the body of the child. Now, the ETs are checking on all of this. They have to check the body and make sure it can handle this and adapt to it and make corrections. Can you begin to see now what, what are you calling abductions, visitations? It's just they are checking on their own people. How hard is that to, to realize? They're checking their own people that they've let come here. They don't want anything to happen to them. So they are checking the energy. Can it, how is it adapting? And they take them on spaceships sometimes. Sometimes things can be done in their room. But it is, they have machines that will upgrade the energy so it can further adapt to the body it's entering so that it can adjust to the new body. This may go on for years, and they're also checking that body to make sure it's not going to get sick, not going to have any problems. This is where you're having the upgrades of the body, and uh, they're constantly monitoring the body to make sure there's no disease, and they're taking care of their own people. You start realizing this, everybody starts thinking they're hurting everybody. This is what I mean, I remove that conscious mind that spreads the fear in there, you see what's really going on. They're helping us. And it's very difficult. Now, okay, now I'm gonna go into the three waves. I've done this enough that I've been kind of putting it into ages. My daughter says she thinks I'm being a little too strict on the age groups, but this is about the best I can do. Anybody born about the time of the atomic bomb, the end of the World War II, because now they're in their early 60s. Not anybody, but the ones in this program. Sometimes after a lecture, somebody will say, how can I get in this program? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any control over that. But they are the first wave, the first ones that come in, were about now in their 60s, before 40s, 50s, 60s. But they're the ones that had the hardest time of all adjusting, the first wave. Now when they came in, they don't want to be here, they don't like it here, they don't like the violence, they don't understand the violence. Why do people have to hurt each other? And strong emotions frighten them. This also goes over into the second way because they don't understand it. They've never experienced it. They don't understand love, hate, even strong love. It is, I mean, uh, hate, fear, even strong love. The emotions are so strong they can't handle it. They don't understand it. So it frightens them. And many of these first wave, they're, they're always saying, I want to go home. I don't like it here. I don't know where home is, I know it's just not here. I get emails from all over the world, hundreds and hundreds of emails, people telling me, I don't want to be here, I don't like it here, I want to go home. One of them told me he was a little boy, I remember being a little boy in the kitchen talking to his mother saying, Mommy, I want to go home. And she's saying, well, you are home. And she said, no, I'm not. But some of you are going to identify with this, because all over the world now, even in China, they said they, they know what I'm talking about. People would come up to me later and say, finally, I thought I was the only one in the world that had these feelings. Now I know there's many, many more like me. But it's the feeling of not wanting to be here, wanting to go home. And many of this first wave try to commit suicide. They're so desperate to get out. They just don't want to be here. And these are the ones I have to work with. The second wave uh, would be, some of these ages kind of overlap, but let's figure 40s, 30s, even into the 20s, that age group. The second wave had it easier. They, 
I asked them one time, why did the first wave have it so hard? They said, because somebody had to be the trailblazer, somebody had to be the pioneer, somebody had to be the first. And the second wave follows in their footsteps, so they have it a little easier. The second wave have it easier. They have what I call antennas, generators, transmitters, channelers. They're here to channel energy. And the energy is to help us as we go into the new earth. The energy is very strong. They can walk through a mall full of people and their energy will affect everybody they come into contact with and they don't even know it. That's what they're here for, with helping going into the new earth, is generating this wonderful energy. And, they, and they, they've come to me and they'll say, well, what am I supposed to do? They want to know what am I supposed to do with my life? You know, what am I supposed to do? And they're told, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is be. And they said, but I want to do something. You are doing something by being. Just here to generate the energy. Now, the irony of this is that even though they're supposed to be working with people and being around people, they don't like people. He said they'd much rather be by themselves. They usually work out of their home. They don't want to be around other people. Some of them don't have any families. Many of the first and second wave don't want to have children because they say children create karma. So they'd rather just live alone. I've had some where the husband and wife have managed to find each other and they're both first or second waves and they get along very well. But they don't like people, but if they realize this is their job, they have to uh, mix with people and their energy is helping. Now the third wave is the children. That's the new children. They're the hope of the world. All of the DNA in all of your bodies is being changed as we go into the new earth. <coughs> Has to be to adapt. These children are coming in with the DNA already in place. And they said, well, you should not put these children on no medication, riddle and none of that. That dampens their abilities. They are the hope of the world. I saw something on uh, the news channel one morning, I'm glad I saw it, where the scientists and doctors were discussing the ADHD with the children. They said, we have now discovered 300 million children have been misdiagnosed and put on medicine they didn't need. And I always suspected that. And they said, we should have knew something was going on. How could such an increase happen in only 20 years? We should have known something wasn't right here. Something else is going on. And they said, the same thing I say, the kids are just bored. <laughs> they told, I speak at lectures at conferences that have to do with the, um, they're educating the educators and about the new children. And they told me to tell them, give them challenges, give them something to do. They're just bored. Uh, even the kids themselves say, well, we learn it so fast, we know it. Why do they keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it? We get it the first time. So give these kids something else to do. Even if you just give them something to tear apart and put back together, you're keeping their minds active. If you have to separate them, give them another si assignment if you're a teacher. You see what I mean? It's just, they are the ones, they're so far advanced. <coughs> At one of my classes I just gave, I think it was in LA, <coughs> I had a man that was in the class in a wheelchair. Funny thing is he's one of the happiest people you would meet. But he said, I think he's maybe first wave, I definitely second wave, uh, but he was all his life, he didn't want to be here, he hated it here, and he kept trying to commit suicide. And he kept saying, it wasn't that bad, I just didn't want to be here. And he tried several ways to kill himself. Once he said he even jumped off of a building. Nothing worked. <laughs> That's because you weren't supposed to. Well, he was in his 30s, he said he, took a gun and he pointed at him, he was gonna shoot himself and he heard this loud voice saying, no, 
And he asked me later, what was that voice? And I said, you mean you don't know what that voice was? <laughs> Your guides, you know, are saying, no, don't do it. He shot himself. He severed his spinal cord. So we didn't kill him, but he made him into a paraplegic. That's what he was telling me. All of these things I was trying to escape from, I had to face anyway. I said, yeah, and then you put all this, this other stuff on top of it, made it more difficult. Well, he didn't get out of it. But he's really happy. He says, it's okay, I've adjusted to it. So a lot of them, they just want out so bad. If they just realize you're here for a purpose, you're here for a reason. And you wouldn't believe the calls, the emails at my lectures, people... There's a lot of you, and I know there's many of you here in the audience are going to say the same thing. I'm one. They come up to me and say, I think I'm first wave, I think I'm second wave. It resonates with them, and now they know they're here for a reason. Okay, the reason you're here, <laughs> I got about 15 more minutes anyway, um, is the new earth. We're headed for the new earth. Everybody keeps saying 2012, what's going to happen in 2012? It is not the end of the world. I don't care what that stupid uh, movie was about. <laughs> it is not the end of the world. And when I was in Russia the last time, I just got through with a five-day class. When you're doing with translators, it's, it's difficult. I was almost done at, at the end of what we were finished, and one of the ones in the class said, please tell us about 2012. There, and I said, no, I'm tired. I want to quit here. And that's going to take a little bit to explain. If please, all they're telling us is doom and gloom, and it's the end of the world. Okay, so I told them what I knew about it, that it is not the end of the world. This is the beginning of everything. You are living in the most exciting times in history right now. This has never happened in the history of the universe before. This is a wonderful time to be alive. And I've explained to them what I found, and you could feel the energy of the room move and shift. It made a difference. And my daughter said later, you could feel it. People who hadn't smiled during the whole class were smiling. And my daughter said later, we affected the energy in that room. Can you feel it? I feel it now, can you feel it? We affected the energy in that room. That affected the energy in Moscow, which affected the energy in Russia. You have a bigger effect than you think you do. But what is happening, it is not the end of the world. December the 21st is going to come and go, and there won't be any difference at all. You won't even notice anything is happening. And they keep saying, when is this going to happen when we move into the new earth? You're doing it now. You're in the middle of it right now. You don't have to wait until December. You're in the middle of it now. It began about 2003, and it's been gradually increasing. What's happening is the Earth is a living being. You know that. The Earth is a living being. Everything is alive. The Earth is going into its next incarnation. It also has incarnations just like people. It just takes it longer. It's going into its next incarnation. This means it's shifting into another dimension. It's changing its vibrations and its frequencies as it moves into another dimension. Now, when this happens, the, it's like the, and this is very hard to explain. I've got it in the book as best I could get it. But it's very hard to visualize it because it's something we can't understand. But it's like the Earth is splitting. The old Earth and the new Earth. The old Earth is where all the violence is, all the, uh, the violent weather, the tsunamis, the earthquakes. All of this is as the Earth is pulling away and separating. That's left with the old Earth. The new Earth is where it's going to be beautiful and wonderful, and we're in it now. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it's when they talk about the um, new heaven and the new earth. That's what they mean. And when some are taken and some are left, and 
uh, you're sleeping with somebody and one is gone and one is left and you're working with somebody and somebody is taken, this is what they mean. The only thing is when St. John wrote that, had that vision on the Isle of Pathos, he didn't realize it was going to be over 2,000 years before it happened. So that's what he saw. But the vibrations and frequencies are changing. And it doesn't just mean boom and we're there. It's gradual process. Now, if we want to go with it, now the earth does not care if we go or not. Doesn't care if the human race goes with it or not, believe me. We're like fleas on a dog. But just as soon, we didn't go with it. But if you want to go with it, your vibration and frequency also has to change to match the earth as it goes. This has been happening since about 2003. And many of you, and I'm going to go into the physical effects since 2003 that the body is experiencing as it happens. You can't change the frequency and vibration of the human body that fast. It would destroy the body. So it has to be done gradually. And that's what's happening. It's gradual. Now, in the last few months, if you're aware of it, you'll notice all of a sudden it's taking a jerk as it is moving faster. February, there was a big jump. Some of you may have felt it in your bodies at that time. But it has to be gradual. It has to be slow or the body would disintegrate. It couldn't handle it. But people have asked me, do I have to die to go to the new earth? No. You take your physical body with you, but you won't even know anything is happening. After we're over there for a while, they said we will eventually turn into light bodies. But at first, it's just our bodies. And, but you begin to notice things are different. Things are bad, better. Things aren't as bad as they used to be. Then you'll know something is really going on. You become more aware of what it is, especially if you start feeling it in your body and the events around you, that it is happening and it's speeding up. You know time is speeding up, don't you? Uh, when I wrote this one book, they told me we were living 16-hour days instead of 24-hour days. Didn't matter what the clock said. Now they're saying it's 12-hour days. Doesn't matter what the clock says. And you know time seems to be just going so fast anyway. First thing you know, the day's gone, the week's gone, the month's gone. <laughs> because time is speeded up. And the scientists have been able to prove this. And one of the books I give the, uh, the, the group that proved that we are living faster, the time is speeding up. OK. So the body is going to feel this. And many of you may have already having these symptoms. The older generation are the ones that will feel it more. The younger generation won't feel it at all because they're coming in with everything already in place. It's the ones in the middle that have the more difficulty adapting as to the changes. Now, these symptoms don't happen all at once. You may have one for a few days, and then it'll go away, and then you may have another one later in the week. It only lasts for a few days. And some people go to the doctors, and the doctors say they can't find anything wrong with them because it has to do with energy and frequencies. Well, here's some of the symptoms that you may have already been experiencing. High blood pressure heart palpitations, you know, where the heart begins to beat too fast and erratically, um, muscle aches and pains, depression is a biggie, and dizziness. Sometimes, never, never, I can feel it whenever it takes a sudden shift, you may have a day or so where you're dizzy, as this is a body adapting. And another one is um, body aches and pains. Ringing in the ears is another way the body is adjusting to the energy. So you've got the high blood pressure, heart palpitations, dizziness, depression, joint aches and pains, and maybe the ringing in the ears. But not all at one time. It'll just be now and then. 
But if you just realize all it's doing is I'm adapting to the changing energies, then you'll be okay. Because all the doctor's gonna do is put you on a pill anyway, because they don't usually know what's wrong. How many of you have noticed that your diets are changing? In order for you to go, the body has to become lighter. So you have to get away from heavy foods that will hold you to the earth. So you have to eat lighter so you'll be able to make this shift. This means to get away from heavy meats. And every one of my clients, they always want to know about their diets. They're always given the same advice. They say the best foods you can eat are live foods. This means fresh fruits and vegetables. Organic if possible, but that's the best food you can eat are live foods. They said chicken and fish, some chicken and fish is okay because it's a lighter meat. But the, the heavy meats, the beef and the pork, are the ones that um, hold you down, especially with all the additives and things they're putting in there. And they said stay away from sugar, which is a little hard sometimes, <laughs> and to drink lots and lots of water. The value of water is beyond belief. There's one tiny thing in water that the body must have, and we don't realize that, but drink lots and lots of water. They said, eventually, you might be already noticing it, we're going to be going to liquid diets. And I've had people on my radio show that I have every week, they'll call in and say, I wondered why I all of a sudden wanted to drink more smoothies. Because we're going more toward liquid diet. After we're over there for a while, we won't eat anything at all, eventually. And I'll, they're going to take the fun out of everything. <laughs> but I was in Sweden a few months ago, and after the lecture, this one young girl came up to me, maybe in her 30s, very pretty, very thin, blonde, and she said, I just want to tell you I have not eaten anything since the day, eaten or drink anything since the day I was born. So they are out there. And I said, well, that, I was thinking that would save a lot of tr uh, trouble cooking and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that would do with your internal organs. You know, we did, we did a lot of discussion about this, my daughter and I. But after that lecture, I had to go to India and to Pyramid Valley and lecture there at a conference outside of Bangalore. It is the largest man-made pyramid in the world. And it ha imagine giving a conference in the energy of something like that. Tremendous. So I brought that up about this woman who had just come up to me and said she had never ate anything. Now, I've had clients who told me when they were born, they, they couldn't, didn't want to nurse, they couldn't eat, didn't want to eat anything. And the doctors had to uh, force feed them you know, with the vein because they didn't want to, they didn't uh, need to eat. And when I, during the session, I would ask them, why that happened, and they said because where they came from, they didn't eat food. But anyway, when I, in the Pyramid Valley, when I brought this up, one of the speakers came up to me and said she hadn't ate anything since the 1990s. And she said she knew there were 30,000, at least 30,000 people in the world who were not eating anything. So it's happening, it sounds weird, but I guess it's, um, it's something we're headed toward. But I don't know about you, but I think food is an entertainment, really. <laughs> well, don't take all of our stuff away from us, anyway. <laughs> but those are some of the things you're going to notice as we do go into the new earth. And this is a very exciting time we're going through right now. Now, can you see how I put this together with the connection with the ETs? If you understand this, it makes it so much easier. And where you came from in the beginning, those of us that are trapped on the wheel of karma. Now, those of you who are on the wheel of karma, like the majority of us, if you want to go, and I've only got a few more minutes here. I don't know if that clock down there doesn't make any sense anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. If you, if you want to go, 
you can't go as long as you're trapped on the wheel of karma because that's a law of the universe. You must return and pay, repay the karma. First thing you've got to do is get rid of karma. It'll hold you back. This means you have to forgive. You've got to let go. So what if your parents mistreated you, if you had a terrible childhood? Let it go. It doesn't matter anymore. It's over, it's done with. What did you learn from the situation? So what if you've got a husband that was horrible to you? Let it go. You carry it around, I said earlier, you're gonna have to come back with the same people and do it all over again with the same people. He's coming, I'm, I'm on the last part. I'm finishing, okay. Okay. But you have to come back and do it again anyway, so you've got to let it go, forgive them. It doesn't matter. You've got a wonderful future ahead of you that you have to move into. So what I tell people to do, now when you do this, you've got to really mean it. But we made contracts with these people to come back and be with them again. Visualize the person in your mind, their face. Doesn't matter if they're dead or not, because it's very difficult to go to that person and tell them this face to face. But you can do this mentally, even if they have died. See that person's face in your mind and you say to them, we tried, we really tried, it didn't work. I'm tearing up the contract. You understand what I mean about the contract? Tearing up the contract and see yourself tearing up the contract and throwing it away. Now you say, I forgive you, I release you, I let you go. You go your way with love, I go my way. We don't need to be connected anymore at all. You have to mean it. And this is the way you get rid of the old karma. Then you have to forgive yourself. None of this is easy, but it's got to be done. It takes two people, remember. Forgive yourself, and then you'll be off of the wheel of karma. The other thing you've got to do if you want to go, let go of fear. Fear holds you to the old earth. Fear is not real. Fear is an illusion. Fear is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> the only thing that's real is love. So if you can go into this, you'll be fine. You'll be going into the new earth and we're gonna have a wonderful, wonderful future. But I'm hoping this all explained the role of the ETs. They've been here forever. And I love working with them. So I think I'm stopping right on the dot according to your clock here. <laughs> okay. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.